Yeah. Connie's seen that happen to me before. I just want to let you know that I'm locked in my room telling my family to leave me alone. If I'm invaded, <laughs> I can't take responsibility for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, likewise. Don't leave me alone. <laughs> I have a pit bull that has actually learned to use his head like a <coughs> ram to come down in the room. <laughs> All right, guys. I think that we will head in the direction of getting started. Um, so I'm just going to do a, a brief bio um, about Jen. And do you prefer to be called Jen or Jennifer? And how do you pronounce your last name? I'm Jen Gavon. Gavon. Okay, good. Yeah. Jen Gavon. Mexican-American writer and activist from the southwestern desert is the author of now four four-length poetry collections. Your daughter came on. <laughs> um, and two chapbooks, and now two novels that are published and one that is out into the world. Um, I am not gonna read much more than that other than, you know, published everywhere. Um, master's degree in English from California State University Fullerton, MFA from Warren Wilson, um, I am handing it over to you, Jen, and we are filming, and you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here, and this is my daughter accompanying me, and my partner's in the room, too, but he doesn't want to be on camera, <laughs> so he's here, too, and this is what we're celebrating, the, um, I'm already going to cry. <laughs> the birth of my book, Jubilee. I am gonna cry. <laughs> so I better look at my notes. <laughs> um, the publishing of this book has been the longest, most arduous road of my writing career. And um, I wanted to tell you just a tiny bit about that because I know that there are so many writers and artists and dreamers here. Um, so I started, why well, I lived this book um, about 20 years ago, which is when um, I was 16 years old, living in the Imperial Valley down um, in Raleigh, um, which is in the, um, on the Southern California border. And um, um, underwent a traumatic experience uh, a similar to, fictionalized but similar to, and draws parallels with my protagonist, Bianca, um, whom we call B in the story. And there's little um, hornets or bees all over the cover that represent her. Um, and I started writing it when Lena was one year old. And I, um, so that was 10 years later, I was 26 years old and I had had this idea in my mind that I was going to write a novel, that I was going to be a novelist. I was a poet and I was writing poems all the time, trying and trying to get published. Um, my manuscript was being rejected everywhere and I just thought, you know, I'm, I wanna write this novel and I have no idea how. I, I mean, I really did not know how. I think I'd written one short story <laughs> in my whole life. And so I heard about this thing called NaNoWriMo, where you write an entire draft of a novel in 30 days, in one month in November. And I thought, you know, if ever there's a time to write this book, it's now when I'm breastfeeding my daughter, you know, I'm, I'm teaching classes as an adjunct. And, you know, I, I mean, it was ridiculous, but I had to do it. And so um, I started, on November 1st, it was like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And by the end of November, I had written, a, I think it was 75,000 word draft of Jubilee. And I was so proud of it. I thought, oh my gosh, this is the longest piece of fiction I've ever written. I had written like 10 pages before and this thing was like 300 pages. And I sent it off to a fellow writer <laughs> and she was like, I mean, she sent me, she was, she was very kind in retrospect. But I mean, her notes back, I was just sobbing for like an hour, my mom and, and partner and everybody know, um, because, you know, it was my first draft of the first novel I'd ever written, drafted in 30 days while I was breastfeeding my daughter. So um, I took about a year to revise it and polish it and got an agent and we sent it out everywhere. She loved it and we sent it out and I was getting... Um, publishers saying things like, I'm a 
bright star on the literary horizon. Um, so I was like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I really did something amazing here. And then it was rejected everywhere. All the major and all the small presses just rejected everywhere. And I couldn't understand it. And, you know, I, my agent left the agency and I was handed off to another agent. And in the meantime, I had started writing Trinity Site and decided that I should go get an MFA. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I wanted help figuring out how to write this properly so that I could get it published. Um, so I earned my MFA in poetry and um, finished Trinity Site. And, you know, in the meantime, I got another agent for Jubilee who loved it and sent it out everywhere again. And again, it was rejected everywhere. So um, by this point, it's like 50 to 100 rejections, maybe, <laughs> you know, like three agents down. Um, but I am that tenacious. You all who know me well know that <laughs> I am a Taurus and I do not give up. And um, and so I, you know, once Trinity Site was ready, I sent that out to an agent and she loved it and said, you know, yeah, we can totally sell this, you know, and I said, well, that's awesome. I also have this other book <laughs> called Jubilee, you know, and I kind of snuck that in there um, to her and she was like, okay, um, sure, I'll read that too, <laughs> you know, and so this sneaky little book, um, went you know and rode trinity sites tail coast and i was like all the time my heart was like jubilee jubilee you know um and when i got my first book deal it was for trinity site jubilee and they wanted to read my third book well i hadn't written a third book <laughs> that's why i hurried up and, and finished one because i got you know 10 years within about 10 years I went from no books published to now two novels published and one hopefully, um, you know, one finished anyway, so three books. So that's the story of The Long Road to Jubilee um, and how it just wouldn't give up. And um, can you see it? Okay, I, it's a glare on my computer. Yeah, okay. Um, I wanted to do a book giveaway throughout and it's gonna, um, I have three books to give away. So if you want to be involved, you can um, go into the group chat there and, um, and answer the questions. So um, I wanna tell you a little bit about Jubilee. Um, and we'll start with, let's see, probably um, the surrealist aspects of it. So if you can tell me your Favorite, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and make this a little easier for, for you, but um, any favorite Mexican woman surrealist, then you can be involved. And so you have, let's say like a minute <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll pick somebody from there. Okay, I was going to say not the one that probably everybody, yeah, there we go. Um, my mom said, said the one, um, your favorite, Mexican woman surrealist. You can Google it. I'm giving you a minute, so Google fast. <laughs> um, so Jubilee is about a young woman on the border, as I said, and um, she comes home to her brother's house in Santa Ana, um, and Santa Ana is how she says it in the book, and um, she's carrying what her family all think is a baby. And it turns out that might not quite be the case. And so I'll, actually, I'll just go ahead and read you that part where um, her brother, Maddie, first meets Jubilee. Bianca, okay, let's see. B says, Maddie, I'll hold your baby so you can rest. She choked out a sob, letting him take Jubilee as she wobbled backward, landing on a couch that reminded her of the borrowed one she'd been bleeding on for two days in the empty house for sale 200 miles away. But soft and beige and beckoning, this one whispered safe, whispered let go. Her eyes fluttered, 
Maddie said, wait, what the hell? His voice reminded her of a flashing siren. It sounded an alarm, something cold and black top and ugly. She squinted, willing herself not to fall asleep. Was something wrong with Jubilee? She tried opening her mouth to speak, but her tongue scraped sand. She'd become a noiseless womb. Mommy's here, she thought of saying, but she couldn't recognize her own thoughts. Bianca, what's going on? He seemed repulsed by Jubilee, holding her away from his body unnaturally. Was he angry? Bianca had stayed in the valley with Gabe and then come back with his baby. Maddie had always hated Gabe. A childhood of abuse had given Maddie a sixth sense that Bianca hadn't developed. Where she trusted everyone, he trusted no one. Yet surely Maddie would forgive her mistakes now that she was here, that she'd come home, accept her for what she'd become. That's why she'd gone to him instead of mama. Hug her, she tried saying. The words wouldn't form. Hold her tight, it's calming. Bianca, what is this? She closed her eyes. Maddie's living room swelled and shrank, a lung breathing her in, breathing her out. Hondro, Maddie yelled, come help me. Something's wrong with my sister. Jubilee was safe. The flash flood was gone. The arroyo was dry. Bianca was a lungfish, drowning. Hondro, get my phone. I need help. Hail Mary, full of grace, switch off the light and grant me peace. And the light switched off. So that's from the opening chapter uh, of Jubilee. And I'm going to get to how, that's in, how that relates to uh, the Surrealists. But let's, um, let's go ahead and do the giveaway. So um, I don't know, let's see. Let's just do between like one and probably 30, 20. I say 20 people. Give me a number. Random number. <laughs> one in 20. Yeah. Lena's picking a random number. Ten. Okay. So I'm gonna I'll scroll down here, but or if um Michaela, if you want to figure that out, maybe. Um the tenth person who named their favorite Mexican woman surrealist one. I gotcha. The I'll give you a name in thing. just one second. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So she goes back to college a few months later. Um, she had dropped out of college for a while and her first semester back after a, a couple of years hiatus, um, she meets someone named Joshua Walker in a Mexican art history class. And um, Joshua is the other point of view that we're gonna get throughout the book. Bianca is Chicana and white, that's her heritage, or I, um, Irish, German, um, and she says she shares ancestry with Frida Kahlo, who is um, Mexican and German. And Joshua Walker is black, he's a black man, um, African-American. And um, so they're talking about the um, the surrealist class. Did we did we get a number, Michaela? I, mean, did. Did I have um, Karen Stewart as our tenth one. And if I've messed up, somebody let me know. But and she said I'm cheating. <laughs> I, I totally cheated. No, Frida was the only one in my head, and I googled it, and I'm like, oh, I like that art. I'll put it in. No, I'm a big cheater. No, <laughs> that works. I'm just qualified. No, Frida. <laughs> Well, no, Frida's who we're going to talk about. <laughs> so yay for Karen Stewart. Um, you can DM me your address that you want me to send it to or your email address. So however you want to do that and, and we'll connect up and I will get you your copy of Jubilee. So thank you. Sweet. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, he, so Joshua is asking her um, whether or not he consider, she considers Frida a surrealist because those of you um, Frida fans know that <laughs> um, that Frida Kahlo said herself, they called me a surrealist, but um, I never painted my dreams. I painted my reality, right? And so that's along the lines of what Bianca is saying as well and um, what Jubilee means to her. Um, and I don't, I mean, the, the, I was going to say, I don't want to spoil it, but I think the book um, cover already does um, that 
And if you didn't get it, uh, Jubilee is a doll. So Jubilee is, um, ah, I'm gonna cry again. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, let's go back to that. <laughs> um, so she says, it depends on what you mean by surrealism. The images are almost always recognizable. They're taken from a reality we accept, but their context re forces us to rethink their purpose. Think about it. If a teacup is covered in fur, I still see the teacup, though I don't know what to do with it or how it got that way. Did it get cold? Did it become mammalian? If a teacup can become like a mammal, can a mammal become like porcelain? The images are recognizable. It's the placement, one or two steps to the side of their reality that brings surrealism to life. All Kafka has to do is make Gregor Samsa a cockroach and nothing else need change in the story. Same house, same family, same concerns. And then Joshua says, so like the two Fridas or the Frida head on the deer, that's surrealism. And, and B says, exactly. Frida said people thought she was a surrealist painting nightmares, yet she painted her own reality. So I'm saying reality is surreal. Know what I mean? And that's really um, an example of what Jubilee is to Bianca. And um, I had an editor um, once who said she loved the book, but she just couldn't quite buy the doll thing. <laughs> And um, so I, I've worked very, very hard to make the doll thing <laughs> um, as much of a metaphor as it's been to my heart. Okay, so um, this book is about the Imperial Valley, like I said, where I grew up on the border. And um, so the next question for you, I have a, um, another free book to give away. And I want to see if you know what goes in Mexican shrimp cocktail besides shrimp. Can you list the ingredients? At least some of them. <laughs> okay, um, so just be doing that. And if you wanted to enter, you can Google it. You could totally cheat, that's fine. <laughs> um, but so it's what goes in Mexican shrimp cocktail besides shrimp. And if Lisa's still here, then I know she'll know because she is one of the ones who taught me how to make it. <laughs> okay, and I have a section that I'll read on that in just a few minutes, but I'm not gonna tell you until you answer the question. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's talk about maybe La Llorona. I have so many pages marked here. I have so many things I wanna share with you. Um, so maybe, let me, while I'm looking for things, maybe someone has a question for me because I'm still kind of new to the whole Zoom thing and I'm a little... One thing I wanted to say, Jen, that you're probably not, you know, able to follow, but I, just some of the comments that are being put here, well, besides the recipe, but, um, you know, just the, the lines that are sticking out to people, reality is surreal, know what I mean? And then mm. Amy said, the doll thing is the novel. No? Yeah. 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 And um, exactly. oh. people are writing gorgeous. Um, somebody else put, if a teacup can become a million, can a mammal become porcelain? And then just all caps, holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> Karen wrote, I'm so loving Jen's love and enthusiasm talking about her book. And other oh. people have been echoing that. Your um, passion and just that. Um, zest and that tenacity. It's just beautiful. We're really fortunate to have you here. And it's nice to have you read uh, portions of it. You Thank have you. us for whatever you want to read. Okay. I had a part about, about the um, La Llorona that I really wanted to read to you, but I'm having trouble finding it right now. And I, I even have notes here, but you know, Here's another, here's another reflection for you, Jen. You're telling a story that absolutely no one else can tell. I love that. Thank you so much. So let me tell you a little bit about Reborns. I think I can do it now. So Reborns are dolls that are made to look um, exceedingly lifelike. And they are sometimes 
often made in the likeness of a baby who has been lost or a child who's grown up. And um, the idea then is that in many ways, this reborn is um, a symbol of that child that was lost um, and brings tremendous comfort to um, PTSD and trauma patients, um, people suffering from um, dementia, um, that idea of nurturing and caring for, you know, um, someone that, that you love that's still there present with you um, because that's exactly what memory is. That's exactly what imagination, surrealism, art, right? I mean, that's what we do. That's what love is. Um, it keeps those that we've lost with us. Woo, okay. I can't find what I was gonna share, but this one is called Night Bloom, and I'd like to read it for you for a little bit. The Brawley Public Library didn't have many books, but it was a life source to be. She wouldn't start at community college for another couple of months, and she didn't have enough money to buy books. Her job at the Desert Herald paid a little above minimum wage, but she was helping mama pay the mortgage on the house for sale, and when it sold, she'd have to find somewhere else to squat. She also had gas and groceries and puppy food and health insurance. Books weren't a luxury, but a necessity. And if she could have eaten the pages rather than the ground beef tacos she sustained herself with, she would have. But the library made it possible for her to eat both books and tacos. And she was currently living on Gloria and Saldua and Ana Castillo, one for sustenance and the other for sweetness, both of which she needed. Anseldua wrote, awareness of our situation must come before interchanges, which in turn come before changes in society. Nothing happens in the real world unless it first happens in the images in our heads. Bianca tried imagining, well, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna skip that part for now. Um, I think, yeah, I think we'll stop, we'll stop there. <laughs> um, again, about the surrealism and, um, and where this book really came from. Um, okay, so did we get everybody that was going to enter into the, yes, I think we got, we got a lot of good um, things here. So give me a number again, again around one and 20. Don't look at the screen. <laughs> Thank you all for entering. I'm so excited to send you Jubilee. And it's still available for pre-order. It officially comes out October 6th, and I'll have signed copies for sale then on October 6th. Um, number 13, Michaela, if you would help me again. Number 13, I'll do it. And also, we need to put your website um, into the chat section so people know yeah. how to purchase Trinity okay. site and um, also Jubilee if Oops. they want signed copies. It's Jennifer so we're going for number 13. Dot, oops, I'm going to spell this wrong. Jennifer, can I spell my own name? Jennifer Givon. <laughs> okay, that's my website. Um, it's available on Amazon and, and um, all of the indie bookstores as well. You can pre order it there. Um, and like I said, I'll have copies available and I'm on all the social media and I can type my, my stuff there in a little bit. But I want to read to you a little bit about. Um, about the um, some cocktail. So this is chapter two, La B, and this is one year before Jubilee. In Gabe's kitchen, Bianca and Gabe's mother, Esme, chopped cucumbers, cilantro, and cubes of Monterey Jack cheese instead of the more expensive abalone or abalone. Who got that one? The cheese instead of the fish. <laughs> Bianca diced with Quick, quick, deliberate strokes, imagining the restaurant she and Gabe planned to open in the Imperial Valley. They would ask Gabe's dad, Hector, for help with the down payment if they didn't chicken out. Hector was a huge, formidable man who scared Bianca, but Esme she loved. Esme she trusted. It was her house Bianca went back to. 
as me threw the mixture into a deep plastic bowl, then peeled shrimp tails, deveined them, and tossed those in while sharing the latest chisme or gossip. Which valley women were cheating and in whose bed and why? But Bianca and Esme still never spoke of what had happened at the Clinicas de Salud, Bianca's freshman year in high school. So um, that's a little bit of um, an intro to the Imperial Valley and the past. So did anyone tell us if you got most of those ingredients? <laughs> right. Um, I think the avocado has always been my favorite part. It's like, you gotta get the avocado ratio right because if you put in too much of the cucumber, then it's like, it almost has this like watermelony, like sweet taste to it. So you gotta make sure there's enough chili in and <laughs> Gotta get it just right. Oh, and the Clamato, did anyone get that? The yeah, Clamato. somebody got the Clamato and yeah. uh, Lisa Sidhu was your 13th responder. <gasps> Lisa, yay! It was so funny. Just as I was about to announce that, she wrote to you, my heart, love you. Oh, yeah, because that, as I was saying, it was perfect that she picked, that Lena picked 13. It was a confluence because Lisa was the one who I first made that with. <laughs> I valley. love that synchronicity. So, That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm mostly going to read the valley scenes tonight because those ones um, just make me really happy. And I think give an idea of place and, um, you know, this is my book launch so I can brag for just a second and brag I want to do just for this one second, um, which is that um, El Maestro, uh, Luis Alberto Rea, author of The House of Broken Angels, wrote about Jubilee. I never thought I'd see the great Mexicali novel. Jennifer Givon teaches us new things about borders, including the shadowy borders of the mind intense. And so, um, you know, there was, there was some caca about American dirt last year, you know, and um, if you're, if you've been thinking about getting a copy of Jubilee, I hope you will, because, you know, I grew up on the border, and this is truly my story that I'm telling you in so many ways. Um, and so if you want to see what it's like to to truly grow up on the Mexicali border in many ways. I mean, this is one story, right? There are so many stories, but that's the point, right? It's not, um, you know, the why was Jubilee rejected so many times? <sighs> there is a story that the mainstream thinks of when they think of Latinx peoples on the border. And, you know, my, my book refuses to tell that story. It has its own heart and its own story to tell. And um, so many Latinx peoples um, have their own stories to tell. My mom, I'm still trying to get my mom to write her story. <laughs> but this is a start. So this is um, about, well, I'll just start. It's, but it's taking place in the Valley. Bianca used to like the rodeo. It came to Brawley each November, Cattle Call Park, filling with kettle corn eating swarms of townsfolk for the event that claimed them statewide fame. The two hotels in town booked up, Main Street held a parade, the rodeo itself transpired in the river's northeast basin, the rich white farmer side of town where the only houses that could pass for mansions spackled the few blocks saddling the cliffs above the park. People from all over the southwest came to watch cowboys and cowgirls barrel race and rope calf. Cars flattened the sallow grass. People trudged dusty fields toward the arena. Sparkly booted girls in pink fringe cowboy hats and suede vested boys and wranglers flashed through the crowd. The smell of barbacoa mixed with musty alfalfa and the metallic chain link fence engulfed them as they approached the booths of concessions below the bleachers. Sweet, salty kettle corn stirred in black cast iron cauldrons sold for $5 a bag, mama's favorite part of the rodeo. Bianca had bought her a bag every time she'd gone with her. As they wandered the concessions before the show, Gabe held Bianca's hand on one side, Lana's on the other. Lana is his daughter. She's a little girl. Um, well, it's, I say that his little girl had recovered quickly from whatever had fevered her the weekend before. They'd already attended the chili cook-off and the cattle call parade, but Lana's energy hadn't seemed to wane. She'd been chatting all morning about the horses and floats, and could she buy this trinket or that sugared snack? 
Gabe steered them toward the Budweiser stand. Its line stretched farther than any other, longer than the kettle corn line. He bought two cups and no one asked questions, though Bianca didn't show ID and couldn't have if they'd asked. Esme had gone ahead with her comadres and was already in the stands when Gabe, Bianca, and Lana took their seats on the benches near the bullpens facing the afternoon sun. Bianca didn't say anything when Gabe handed her a beer. As she sipped it, a girl she knew from high school sang the national anthem, all American Idol style, kicking off the rodeo. People cheered and yelled as the first event unfolded, wild bronco saddling. Only men ran into the arena, though women joined in most of the other events. The bullhorn blasted. Bianca peeled paint chips from the bench as she watched the sticky mess clotting under her fingernails. Um, and it goes on. Um, but I just wanted to describe the, um, the feel of the place to you. Okay, um, let's see. What about dates? Who here likes dates? I'm talking about the fruits, right? Ra like, raise your hand, tell me if you like dates. Page 237. <laughs> I've got dates written here. <laughs> um, past the Salton Sea, the date farm signs Lord. Stop and drink date shakes here. She'd never stopped for a date shake because dates reminded her of the tall palms in the empty lots behind her house with a no trespassing sign she ignored, where she picked dates that had fallen to the hard packed earth and chucked them at passing cars or down into the ravine toward the river. She'd never actually eaten a date, although she'd sucked on figs whole summers long. Dates reminded her of cockroaches, the swollen creatures that scuttled, then flew. She could never bring herself to put one in her mouth. But the signs boasted cold, refreshing, sweet. So she asked Gabe to stop and he bought her one, frothy and amber colored. She made a face as she took a sip. This is gross. I knew I'd hate dates. Then why do you want a date shake? <laughs> so. That's just kind of um, one iconic thing about when you're driving to the Imperial Valley, you pass that all the date stands past the Salton Sea. <laughs> so I was tricking you. You thought I love dates with you, but no. <laughs> you totally got some people. They were like, yeah, hungry, hungry. And then somebody said, yep, definitely don't want one now. And then no longer hungry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's go back to the shrimp cocktail. I promise you there's lots and lots and lots of good food in here. <laughs> and even a, sort of a couple of recipes as well. Okay, um, a couple more. Do we have time? Are we good? Or how are we doing? You're doing great. Just keep okay. going. We're having fun. <laughs> All right. Um, so speaking of recipes and the like, Surprise, surprise, Bianca is a poet. <laughs> that is what she wants to do when she grows up, like someone you probably know. Um, and so that's also really the story of the book. This is a Bildungsroman. Do you remember what a Bildungsroman is? <laughs> a, com a coming of age, what is it? <laughs> a coming of age story. Um, and so this is, this is also really, um, how Bianca becomes a poet or realizes that she's already, always already been a poet. And so there's a lot of poetry in the book as well. And um, I want to see if you know who said these lines, and I'm sure many of you will. So that's the third book I'm gonna give away. If you know who said these lines, and don't tell us, <laughs> Lena knows. <laughs> okay, so, Tell us the poet. And I'll just say maybe the first one who can tell us, who can type it. Because I think a lot of people will know this one. Oh, wait, I think that that's, I'm trying to, Michaela, am I making sense? Is that, what would be the best way to do? The yeah, just one? do the first, do the first one, Jen. Uh, the yeah. first one to answer it correctly. And probably people do know what poets quoted, but we'll see. Yeah. Let's do the first one. I'm sure they do. Okay. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul 
and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. <laughs> That's right. And so who said it first? Oh, there we go. Ambra. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Ambra got that one first. <laughs> Yay, Ambra. <laughs> <laughs> she does know it. She's nervous. She can say the whole poem. <laughs> We're so, that's awesome. Thanks for doing that. That's right. Good job. So there are whole poems of Bianca's in here. And I want to read you one because it resonates so much with um, my own story and Bianca's story. And I actually stole it from my own work. Um, I took it from, I took it from Protection Spell. So there is crossover and you'll see that you um, fellow poets and poetry aficionados who've read my previous collections, you'll see that there is crossover, um, not necessarily in whole poems, but, um, you know, in lines and ideas and themes and images. Um, so this is um, a poem called, let me tell you a little bit, a little story about this. Cause it, it starts out, Bianca wrote a poem in New York. And so as I was writing this novel, I'm, I'm actually revising it. This is probably draft number three at this point, you know, and I, I think I've just turned 30 years old and I've just won the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. And so I have some money in my pocket um, to go places that I've never gone. And so all of a sudden I'm just writing this, you know, and, and B and I are, are going along. And she says, I'm going to New York. And I'm like, what do you mean you're going to New York? I've never been to New York. I don't know anything about New York except what I've seen in the movies. Like, how am I gonna write about you in New York if I've never been to New York? So I look up a flight to New York and I ask my mom and dad if they can watch the kids. My kids must have been, you know, three and five at the time. I said, can I go to New York this weekend? And she's like, oh. my mom is like, okay, <laughs> that's out of the blue. But it's the first time I've ever had money to just do that, you know, with the NEA. So I jumped on the plane and flew, my partner and I flew off to New York for the weekend. And then I was able to write B in New York. <laughs> uh, and it was amazing. And then, um, I was able to take the kids to New York. I'd actually, um, I, I didn't get in a plane until I was 21 years old. I grew up, like I said, in the Imperial Valley, like I think the, there was an airport there for crop dusters, but the closest like real airport would have been in San Diego or up near Los Angeles, like Riverside County and that San Bernardino County. Um, so I'd never been on an airplane. I was scared of airplanes, but when Trinity site was published, my publishers invited me to New York for BookCon. And I said, okay, but can I bring my family? And they said, sure. <laughs> so my books have not only taken me places that I've never been, but they've taken my family places that I never would have been able to take them without these books. So. Um, I'm just so grateful. And you'll see when I read the poem, why, oh yeah, we went on a plane to QVC. Okay, we did. R Richard Simmons flew us, my mom and I, to QVC. <laughs> that's, a, that's a trivia for you all. My mom and I were in a, um, sweat into the oldies five. And um, we flew to QVC as the mother and daughter success story. <laughs> but, but I was like 20, Five at that point so you know <laughs> okay so this is the poem that B wrote in New York I believed all poets were dead and that I'd be the only poet in the world I had no idea there were others besides the Frosts and Dickinsons never heard of coffee houses or spoken word where I grew up we barreled bonfires and burst kegs ended in ERs for drunk driving quads in the sand or trying to keep up with the boys, drink for drink. But I loved poetry, even if I didn't know where it lived. 
poetry tasted like the chile con limon on the rim of the plastic beer cup, smelled like alfalfa in the menudo pot. I ate it with a knife. Though I met Frida, she was a painter and she was dead. I want to be the first Latina poet to win the Pulitzer. I looked it up online. None ever has. Do they dare look us in the mouths? At my scholarship writers conference, the one Latina editor lifts her pointed Jimmy Choo's from beneath the speaker's panel and says, I'm tired of reading about barefoot Latinas. All the Latinas I know wear shoes and they're fabulous shoes. So that's the, that's the poem that um, V and I wrote in New York. <laughs> and I see, do they dare look us in the mouth? Thank you so much. Okay, I could go on and on. I mean, you can tell this is my heart and I'm so jubilous <laughs> to be able to share it with you. Um, but let me see if you have questions instead of, I won't read it to you, you just get it, you pre-order it, you order a signed copy from me or from um, Blackstone, and um, then you can, you can see the heart. But questions? I ch I've been checking the, um, okay, no. how do we order a signed copy is what okay. somebody has asked in chat. Yeah, okay. that is a great question. I should be more organized. <laughs> I don't, um, I, I will, I'll, I'll give you details, I'll, I'll write it in the, let me think, um, how do you order signed copies? You DM me or message me or email me um, and I'll, for now, I'm, I, I guess I'll make it available somewhere, but um, Venmo is how you can, is how you can send me the, um, the funds. At this point, um, I, thirty dollars is will co will cover the hardcover signed and um, shipping, and so my Venmo is at Jennifer Givon, and um, so you could just send me that, and then just make sure that I have your mailing address. That would be amazing. That's perfect. That's very helpful. Yeah. And then if, if there's anything else that I wanted to share with you, but did we have? If you're not time? already following her on Facebook or Twitter, you know, I would suggest doing so. You're, you know, it's easy to find, and that way you can keep up with different things, other other uh, book launches. I'm trying to think if there's anything else fun that I wanted. I have I have so many pages marked here that I wanted to share with you, but um, I'm double checking if I've missed any. Okay, Jen, what is the name of the third novel, the one that you have just sent out this week? <laughs> Okay, let me tell you a little bit. You get the, because you sat here and like watched me almost cry five times, um, you get the sneak peek about my newest book that I just finished and I'm so excited about. Um, so I am secretly in love with psychological thrillers and a good murder mystery will keep me up all night long. You know, I love my poetry, I love my literary fiction, but I also love murder mysteries and just scary things. <laughs> I can read scary things. I can't watch scary things, but I can read the books. And so one thing that I was noticing again and again, just like with the idea of, you know, how can they look us in the mouths, you know, and all these stories that aren't being told, I, I was noticing like, why do, does everyone in the murder mysteries that are, you know, the mainstream, kind of more literary, um, literary thrillers for, I mean, yeah, for women, why do they all live in New York? Why do they all live in London? Why are they all, you know, um, like upper middle class? And so I was like, where are all the women of color? Where are all the people of color? You know, and so um, that was my goal, was to write a story that was about the protective magics of people of color. And so the kind of curanderismo and hoodoo um, and really um, the spiritualism um, and uh, of people of color. And I thought, you know, just like I did with Trinity Site where I married magical realism and science fiction and women's fiction and poetry and I'm like, I don't care about genre. I just want to tell you a story. Um, I did that with my third novel and it's 
my kind of like Chicana gone girl or something. <laughs> so my protagonist is Latina and it takes place here in New Mexico in a, um, a small town that's on the suburbs of Albuquerque. It's called Los Lunas and it's on the Rio Grande. And so the name of the book, all of that, the name of the book is River Woman, River Demon. And so um, I am very, very, very excited. And I told my little brother the other day, he asked me, what's the name? And I said, I didn't give him context. I just said, River Woman, River Demon. And he's like, that sounds scary. <laughs> and I said, um, it's actually not, it's more about brujeria, which are witches and witchcraft and magic. Um, and there's ghosts. So Toni Morrison fans, I, you know, get ready. I, you know, this is, this is one of the most fun that I've had writing a book ever. And, you know, I wrote a book about the apocalypse and, you know, demons um, in Trinity site, but, but still like this book was a lot of fun to write. And so um, it's not really about demons. So those of you who are, you know, scared of them, don't worry. Um, but yeah, Chicana, she calls herself a Chicana Nancy Drew wannabe a couple of times. <laughs> And there's a character that I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, because I, I have this much faith, um, La Detective. So. <laughs> oh, that's so yeah. exciting. And I really want to get to this question, because I think this is very important. And I think it's part of the reason, you know, why us as a group can help as a community. And this person asks, in addition to purchasing the book, how can we support you and Jubilee? Pandemic book releases are challenging stuff. Yeah. Um, so just share it all over the place. Let's get it. I was noticing and I was, I'm so proud of and excited for Mexican Gothic. Um, the cover, I, I don't have it with me. I'm, I'm reading it right now. I'm in the middle of reading it and it's just been everywhere. And I'm so excited, you know, um, a Mexican Canadian um, author and someone tell me her name because it slipped my mind at this moment who wrote Mexican Gothic. Um, they'll tell it. I know one of you is going to come through and tell us right now, maybe um, Jen Crone. Um, but it's everywhere. And so that's what you can do for me with Jubilee is post pictures because everybody's on social media right now. You know, we're making those connections. I'm so grateful for you all being here with me. Um, and so we're, we're meeting up with each other. Yeah, Silvia Moreno Garcia. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful book, by the way. But oh, here we go. And it's been everywhere. And so, um, you know, that's what you can do um, because the you know the buzz that we create around books is just when we hear about it we're more likely to buy a book when a friend tells us about it you know um and so if you know if one of my friends is telling me it's a great book i'm gonna you know put it on my my list but then if two or three or four or five friends are telling me like this is an amazing book well you know i bought it yesterday and it, it's on my nightstand um so that's what you can do is just spread the word that Jubilee is here finally, um, and that these are the kinds of, not the only, the kinds of Latinx stories, you know, that are important to share. They're, they're not part of the, you know, mainstream, well, part of the stereotype, I would say, of what it's like to be Latina, to be Mexican American, Chicana in the United States, and to grow up on the border. You know, um, all the characters are wearing shoes most of the time, you know, and, um, um, and she's, you know, B is of mixed heritage, but, um, and she has, you know, her dad is white, but that is a story that's still important um, to tell. And so, yeah, just share it widely. That would be amazing. Um, I think, yeah, because one of the things that I wanted to say too, and um, is that I, I am struggling to find, you know, what it means to have a platform um, because editors have mentioned that Part of you know the reason that my books are not you know selling to the big New York publishers um, is that I don't have a platform and I don't really know what that means because I do right it's empowering women um, that I mean that's empowering girls and women is my platform and, and always has been and always will be in shedding shame um, you know making room for poetry and and finding the lyric in um, fiction 
motherhood, raising children, writing while raising children, and so much of it too um, is that motherhood in our society and especially in the literary world is given lip service but no real recognition. And I always scan the lists, you know, of award winners and, um, you know, I'm always looking for like uh, who's writing about motherhood and, and getting recognized and it is so problematic. That, um, that mothers and mothering books are still relegated to this niche. And it's like, who do you think is raising our generation, our next generation, who is raising our voters and our readers and our thinkers and our dreamers? And so, you know, all of my books are about motherhood and look at it from very complex um, perspectives. And so that's my platform. Um, so if y'all would are here and I love you so much, thank you for supporting me. And, and that's really how you could continue supporting me is just like helping me whatever that means to build a platform of mothers empowering women and that's one of the things that I recognized really early on about you that really attracted me to you um, I also wanted to add this is a, a very important question and a good idea if a book club was featuring your book is that something you'd be willing to come and talk to them about and yeah, I'm trying absolutely. to find out who said that so you can get connected to them. Yeah, that's Kathy Paul, and she lives near me, so we, yeah, we can. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I can't guarantee that I won't, like, be, <laughs> you know, say all these kinds of things that I say. I just, um, I get so excited to talk about the books. But um, I, I was invited for Trinity Site to talk to a group of scientists, and somehow I ended up for Trinity site, I, somehow I ended up telling them about how when I write, I rock out to like Leonard, Leonard Skinner, like, and I'm, you know, it's like I'm typing, like I'm playing the keyboards and, you know, why did I tell a group of scientists that? I don't know. Well, that's part of what makes it fun in my mind, Jen, but you know, I think that's part of the reason why I like uh, writers is because it, we're a very associative group and what Oftentimes, exactly. what comes in our mind comes out our mouth. Yeah, um, exactly. I have all these notes, but I mean, like, you know, you can't see them, but I, I don't think that I talked about even half of the notes. Like, you know, it's poetic free association, and that's just what it is. <laughs> well, there was one other question that I did want to get to. Somebody was asking about your writing process and how do you move between genres? Do you have something set or do you just kind of free flow? Oh, I free flow. Um, you know, I write what I have to write when it's coming to me. And I, I you know, I just trust the muse and there are quiet times. Um, right now I have, I've just finished up the, the next book as I told you. And I've got the inklings of my fourth novel, you know, really uh, dancing around in my mind. And I've got some inklings of poetry dancing around in my mind and, um, I haven't put anything to paper yet, but I'm just, it's going to be a fun uh, journey to find out which gets to the paper first. It's going to be like a race, like is a poetry book or is it going to be, uh, am I doing NaNoWriMo this year? I, Marisa, I would like to, let's do it. <laughs> I think I'll write the next, the next book, whichever that is during NaNoWriMo. But um, so for instance, with Trinity Site, <laughs> I wrote Rosa's Einstein, which I don't think I have a copy of here. I think I'm sold out. Um, and I wrote Trinity Site at the same time because I was researching the Los Alamos um, National Laboratory up a couple hours above um, Albuquerque, which made the first atomic bomb. That was where the Manhattan Project took place. And then um, the first atomic bomb was tested here um, down by Las Cruces in White Sands and uh, on a Trinity site, but that's S-I-T-E and minus site as in the vision that Calliope, the protagonist has when she really falls into this story. And so I was learning all about the science, the nuclear science, and at the same time, I was um, enmeshing myself in the indigenous stories and beliefs of the Puebloan peoples of um, the Rio Grande region. And, um, and so what came out of that was the novel Trinity Site, but at the same time, I also had all of these images going through and, and all of these other characters and I was like, well, do I write another novel? But I'm writing this novel, what do I do? So in between, I would write these poems. And 
I didn't even realize, honestly, I, I told Avra about this, she knows. Um, one day I said, let me look and see what's going on with all these poems I've been writing. And I put them all into a file and realized, when did I write this book? <laughs> you know, I had like almost the complete manuscript of Rosa's Einstein, which was originally in my mind, it was um, Einstein's imaginary daughters. That's what it was called. And it came because I was just, my grandma Marge is right there, I'm seeing her. Uh, I was just telling her about this the other day that um, I had read a poem by Van Jordan about um, Maleva Merik, who is Einstein's first wife, who actually helped him in many ways work through with her own theories and ideas as well, the math that they were doing together, they went to graduate school together, um, come up with his most famous theories, right? E equals MC squared, like she was there with him, she was raising his kids with him and helping him do the math. And I had no idea who she was until I was 30 years old and I encountered it in a poetry book. And so that got me, that sent me down the rabbit hole looking into, you know, all the other women that are ignored and have been forgotten. And it turned out that Einstein had a daughter as well that nobody knows what happened to her. Um, it was with him and Maleva and um, it was out of wedlock at the time. And so people think maybe they placed her for adoption, but nobody really knows. So that sent me on this whole other path. But um, the nuclear physics was there as, as I was in the astrophysics as I was writing Trinity site. So just in terms of like, do I have a plan? No, God, no, I don't have, I don't have a plan. Like, you know, I'm raising two children and teaching, you know, three to six classes as an adjunct per semester. I don't even have a plan for dinner, you know, like God only knows what we're going to do um, in, you know, in half an hour or whatever, we're going to figure something out, but no, I don't have a plan. I just let the muse come and I trust that the stories that are exciting to me are going to be exciting to other people, you know, and, and I trust that. And it turns out they are, <laughs> you know, I'm so grateful you all are here. Um, I hope that answers. That's question. perfect. And I wanted to let everybody know, please unmute, because I think we probably all want to go ahead and clap and say thank you so much. <laughs> it's oh. hard to be silent this long, guys. Thank oh you, God. Jen. Thank that you, Jen. was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. <sighs> Thank you so very much. Yeah, I'm going to let you read over the chat sections. If anybody has a question, just, you know, feel free to jump in. Um, you know, that's uh, definitely something I want people to feel like they can interact. And, and I'm glad that people have been putting so much in the chat. There's been a lot of congratulations too, Jen. I'm, I'm hoping you're getting to see those. Your schedule sounds really busy. How do you even find time to write? Do you have a disciplined time of the day or? Oh, I wish, I wish. Um, I mean, I tell myself I'm gonna get up at five in the morning and start writing, you know, but then I get up at five in the morning and I'm exhausted and nothing's coming, you know? And so, so and I'll just tell myself, go back to sleep. Why am I doing this to myself? You know, go back, you need sleep. Um, and I, I heard Les, my friend Leslie um, is my dear friend and she's a mother as well and a writer of both genres as well. And we're always telling each other like, you know, it's okay, you know, and all of you that are struggling during this time, like I posted that I finished a novel during the pandemic. And, um, you know, at the same time, so many other things in my life have kind of gone by the wayside, you know, and that's okay, because we choose our joy. And that's what I'm choosing, right? Um, so, you know, I'm not exercising as much as I want to, you know, I'm not making the healthiest choices for, for meals, every meal, but you know, I mean, I'm living, I'm alive, I'm surviving as we all are just trying to get by. And so I really just try to make it my joy and to, um, you know, and, and tell myself like, this is important now. And I've had to learn how to write when the kids are being noisy. Um, but at the same time, they know that if it is mama's time to write, which is like, let's say 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., right? Or whatever, whatever time I've crammed it in, it's like, be quiet. <laughs> Mama is trying to write, you know, and, and they will, and they'll, you know, they'll go entertain themselves. Um, my mom and dad used to live with me. Um, and that's how I was able to get a lot of the writing done when my children were babies. Yeah. And that, so I could just like, 
you know, throw them at my mom and dad, like, take that, and, and go rather, rush off to Starbucks for an hour or two. And I would just sit, like, when I was doing the Leonard Skinner thing, like, I have a very clear memory. I was actually in the car in front of Starbucks, and I'm sure people were walking by thinking, like, I was the nuttiest person in the world, but I don't care. I had that hour or two, and, you know, I wrote a very challenging, emotionally heavy scene in that time. So I steal the moments. I steal the joy. I make the time. Um, you know, yeah. And, and I encourage you all to do the same. Your words are important. Your stories are important. Your joy is important, you know, and we have work to do. We have a lot of, you know, there's you know, we all need to get the vote out in November. And that is so important. A lot of my work is about social justice. It is so important that we are paying attention to what's happening in the world. There, these are scary times. Trinity site touches on that. You know, it is terrifying to me how accurate Trinity site predicts what's happening right now. But that's because I'm going by the indigenous stories and the indigenous peoples know because this has happened to them again and again. This isn't new. What's happening with our government now and what they're trying to do to the land, trying mm -hmm. to do to the people, you know, it's not new. And so it's so important that we are fighting and that we are aware and awake and vigilant. But at the same time, right, the only way that we're gonna get through is if we hang tight to the joy, you know? And so that's what we're doing. And I'm homeschooling Lena and, and my son, and, um, and we're just like having dance breaks all the time, <laughs> you know, and we're just, we're doing a lot of art. Uh, thank you, Kathy, for the art notebooks. She gave us some art notebooks and we're doing, you know, we're doing the, the meat as well, the meat and potatoes. I call up my dad, the mathematician and ask him like, remind me when I do the exponents versus the, you know, so I, <laughs> as well, but we're really, trying to hang on to that joy. And so that's, um, that's what I encourage you to do in terms of, if you need a plan, make a plan. But, you know, I, I use a plan so that I, I, so I can like write a poem on the back of it and I forgot the plan. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks ago's plan and that's not at all how it happens. <laughs> yeah. Amy just wrote joy is a subversive act. Yes. And then Marissa Amy. said that uh, Trinity Site was the first book she read in 2020, and boy, uh, was it the perfect book for 2020. Yeah, exactly. And I realized, like, even in the beginning when um, Calliope says that everything was stained red, and then all of my West Coast friends and family are showing us the harrowing photos coming from, you know, um, San Francisco and Portland and, um, you know, and, and the red landscapes. And so it's like, uh, I don't want to be right about what's, what we're doing to our earth, but we are doing damage that is critical. It's at the, it's reached the critical mass and it is time now, like right now for us to do something. So vote, vote, please vote. <laughs> Well, I, I realize that we have come to time and I apologize with the open mic because we, um, I had one person that wanted to read and if they want to do so, you sure can. But I think I just had one person written down. Um, if not, we can take a moment just to say thank you to everybody that's here and thank you most especially to Jen. Um, it was wonderful. I knew, yeah, I knew it would be. I've been looking forward to this all week. Thank you so very Thank much. Thank you so much, Michaela, for Thank having me. I, yeah, pleasure. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Um, and I was just trusting the universe, trusting God. And, um, you know, and you reached out to me and I just like, I told my family like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a launch after all. So yeah, I, I had so a total much. fangirl moment and I just reached out and said, hey, would you do this? <laughs> Thank uh, you for trusting that it was okay to show up here absolutely i do and that's i mean that's really what it's about for me too I, you asked if i had a, someone else someone, um, laura asked if i had a plan no my plan is just to like trust every opportunity that i mean not not in a gullible way but you know i mean i'm i'm wise in that way but if an opportunity comes like i'm gonna trust that this is the path that i'm gonna take and i do and i step out in faith and you know and that's how jubilee is here just yeah <laughs> thank you thank you all so much Mwah.
Thank Bye. you. Thank Good you. to see your family too, Jen. Be well, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye, Grandma. Bye, Bye, Jen. Bye. Love you. Love you. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> <Mwah>. <laughs>